evening. Welcome. I'm Ken Johnson, uh, CEO and President of Hutchinson Regional Healthcare System, and I want to welcome you tonight to uh, first course presentation. I think we can all relate to tonight's presentation. It's about uh, our feet hurting, and when your feet hurt, everything hurts. Tonight we're going to hear about the best and newest treatments of stress fractures, ankle arthritis, and other painful conditions that affect our feet and wound care. Dr. Jeffrey Kramer is new to the Hutchinson area and has set up his practice at the Hutchinson Clinic just across the street from the hospital. He is a graduate of Des Moines University College of Medicine and Surgery and recently completed his residency in podiatric medicine and surgery at West Houston Medical Center. Dr. Kramer is a member of the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons and the American Podiatric Medical Association. Dr. Kramer is a runner and has special interest in sports medicine, and he just told me that he's going to start uh, taking patients in our wound care clinic beginning on, uh, in December on Fridays, and so he might talk a little bit more about that. But please uh, join me in giving a warm Hutchison welcome to Dr. Jeffrey Kramer. Uh, we'll get started here. You'll have to, there's some technical difficulties trying to get my computer and this to match up, so uh, bear with me. Uh, so tonight's presentation is called a review of the foot and ankle. Uh, like, it's, like he said, I'm at um, Hutchinson Clinic, and we'll talk about that here. But some goals for tonight. First of all, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, we'll go over uh, what today's podiatrist is, uh, as it has changed significantly uh, from what you may remember podiatry to be over the last 20 years. And then we'll get into some basic topics in regards to anatomy, uh, covering, oh, there you go, see it's already happening, uh, covering some anatomy, some con and basically we're just going to, from a very uh, broad perspective, go over some of the common things I see in clinic. So a little bit about me. First of all, uh, I'm from, I, I did join Hutchinson Clinic across the street. We're in the 2107 building. That's at the west side of the parking lot in the same building as orthopedics and physical therapy. Um, so it's kind of, we're all on the same level, all on the same, uh, just right down the hall. Um, originally, I'm from Dubuque, Iowa. That is a, it's a town of 60,000 people. So it's a little bit bigger than here, uh, but not too much different. And it's, Dubuque's a town on the Mississippi. It's about nine hours away from here. And I grew up on a farm. We had uh, hogs and then some corn and soybeans. Uh, I did my undergraduate at the University of Iowa. I got degrees in finance and marketing. Uh, I went and worked for a couple of years, learned a lot of uh, tough but valuable life lessons, and uh, ended up deciding to go back to school and, uh, and, and took a bunch of science classes and went to podiatry school. Uh, this was at Des Moines University in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, it's, it's, four years of school, and, and then I went to uh, Houston, where I, I just got back from, and it was three years of residency training. It was there, on the, literally on the very first day I moved to Houston, um, I met my beautiful future wife, Christina, who's somewhere in the back there. I won't make her stand up. Uh, but literally, the very first day I moved to Houston, um, I, I met her. And, uh, and we got married during my uh, second year of residency. And, and then we just recently moved here. So, so we have two dogs. Uh, right now we're living in a small house in town. Uh, with Hopefully within a couple of years, I'd like to get some, uh, some animals and land. Um, here's a picture of Christina and I on our farm in Iowa. Uh, so I'm not really sure what all this farm is going to entail, but I uh, ho hope to raise alpacas, mini donkeys, uh, a few goats. Uh, she thinks we're going to have a pig that lives inside the house, but uh, we'll see about that. Um, I'm, I'm not really sure what else is going to end up on this farm. Uh, she she kind of has a habit of touching and petting pretty much anything. Uh, starfish, grasshoppers, slugs, clams, and then something that's kind of a, a Texas specialty. Uh, there's actually drive-through safaris in Texas. Um, you can, it's, it's literally a wildebeest that you know, roams the plains of Africa that is, uh, you're just leaning out your car window and petting a, a, a wildebeest. So, um, only in Texas. Uh, and then also bees. So we're going to raise bees. Um, you may not have known this, but you can actually pet bees. Here's a picture of her in, uh, actually petting a bee. So, um, so she's, she, lo she loves animals. 
Uh, so, so quickly, what, what is a podiatrist? So uh, my degree, it's a DPM, it's a doctor of podiatric medicine. Um, it, it has changed uh, significantly the, the, uh, the last couple years. Um, well, so first of all, so the schooling, the first two years is, is just like MDs, DOs, it's the basic science courses. The third and fourth year, you focus specifically on the foot and ankle, and then, and then you go off to residency. Uh, my training was comprehensive, covered everything from uh, basic wound care, basic conservative care and clinic, uh, getting into more complex surgeries um, that we'll, we'll talk about some of the basics of. Uh, so it, uh, it, like I said, podiatrists changed a lot over the last 20 years. So, you know, so some of you may remember uh, a podiatrist who shaved your parents' or grandmother's calluses when they were young or maybe made a pair of orthotics or something like that. And, and while that's still something that's very important and, and absolutely something that I do, um, the field has, has, has grown a lot in, as far as the scope of practice over the last 20 years. Uh, specifically here in Kansas, um, they kind of joined the rest of the nation and they granted privileges for, uh, for doing surgery and treating the ankle uh, two years ago. Um, so now not everybody's able to do that, um, only essentially people with some of the newer training are allowed to do that. So, so back in your hometown, if you're not from Hutchinson, you may know of a podiatrist who, own, who doesn't do surgery or just does a little bit of a forefoot surgery like bunions and hammer toes. Um, but I, I basically cover all aspects of the foot and ankle, um, including ankle surgeries. So, um, and and so so my goal my goal tonight is basically to to present myself to you as a, a foot and ankle specialist. Uh, it's not just covering bones, not just covering feet, or excuse me, uh, uh, ligaments or, or nerves or skin, um, but all aspects of the foot. Uh, and. And, and, but, but it still requires an understanding that you know, the foot bone's connected to the leg bone, and the leg bone's connected to the hip bone, and so on. And, and it's not just a foot. It's, uh, there's a lot of uh, serious uh, medical conditions, basically centered around uh, blood flow and, and uh, sensation and nerves, um, that actually manifest themselves initially in the foot. And so performing a proper physical exam and, and understanding overall medicine is, is definitely important. Uh, so, the foot and the foot and ankle. It's it's simple and complex at the same time. You know, it's it's not the heart. It's not the it's not the brain. I'm not I'm not doing brain surgery, um, but it's but it, from a very simple perspective, like uh, like Ken said, I mean the foot's it's what you walk on every day. It's it's the foundation on which your movement is uh, is is based. And so if your foot hurts, everything hurts. Um, it's 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 complex in the sense that I mean you can see from the the pictures here. There's lots of there's, there's uh, you know, 26 bones uh, in each foot. There's 33 joints. There's over 100 uh, ligaments and muscles and tendons. Uh, so, so there's a lot going on there. Uh, but we can actually use that to some of our advantage. And, and, and we'll talk about that. So some basic concepts in regards to uh, treatment of the foot and ankle. Uh, conservatively, and, and the most important thing that I can explain to patients and, and that I can understand myself is that is that life goes on even if you have foot, uh, foot and ankle problems. Uh, so, you know, people have, they have jobs to go to, they have kids to feed, grandkids to take care of, uh, places to go. And, and so while I, it's, it's a balance of, of me treating your, your symptoms and your pain and, and balancing life. Um, so while, while in theory and academically the best treatment may be you not put any, putting any weight on your foot for six to eight weeks. In some cases, that's not, that's not realistic. And, and so it's a, it's a balance, and it's something important for me to understand that um, when it comes to devising uh, uh, treatment plans for patients. So uh, other things in regards to conservative care, um, you know, are we treating the symptoms or are we treating the underlying deformity? Oftentimes with symptoms, that's what you're treating conservatively. And then when you're no longer able to achieve success uh, treating the symptoms, you then maybe uh, more advanced uh, uh, treatment or, or surgical treatments necessary in order to uh, treat the underlying deformity. Uh, from a surgical perspective, first of all, and, and you'd be amazed how many, how often I, this comes up, um, but does it hurt? You know, I, I tell people, I, I don't treat x-rays, um, I'm not in the cosmetic foot surgery business, and you know, I, I do have patients come in and they don't, they think they have ugly feet, and they, they don't like the way their feet look in sandals or, or in, um, 
uh, or walking on the beach. But you, if it doesn't hurt, you don't do surgery on it. It's, it's, it's actually that simple, but uh, for some people, it's, it's not. Um, and other things that are important, uh, first of all, uh, determining uh, what, how severe the deformity is. Some deformities, in, specifically in regards to bunions, you treat one a mild bunion one way, you treat a moderate bunion a, a, or a severe bunion a different way. Um, age, age is certainly an issue. You know, the, the type of treatment you do for a 20-year-old athlete is completely different in regards to an 80-year-old patient. Uh, they, you know, they have much different, uh, much different lifestyles, much different abilities to heal, and, 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 and much different uh, requirements of, of normal living. Uh, and finally, uh, it's also important, compliance is a big issue. Uh, again, going back to the, the, the patient of, of not being able to put pressure on something for six to eight weeks. If, if I suggest do and want to perform a surgery on somebody that's, that I know is not going to be compliant um, and is going to walk on it when I tell them, no, you need to not walk on it for six to eight weeks, uh, I've, I've failed them as a doctor and I've done them a disservice because it's going to, you know, it, it takes bones six weeks at least to heal. And, and even though you put plates and screws and other things in there, um, they're only so strong. And so if somebody walks on something, you, they're now at greater risk of something else because the, everything fell apart regardless of how great a surgery I did. So uh, getting into some things uh, quickly, uh, so some common pathology skin problems I see, corns, calluses, warts, ingrown nails. Uh, corns and calluses are by far the most important. There's some uh, more, there's a little bit deeper level of understanding that's necessary. Uh, so a callus, uh, first of all, a callus or corn, it's just like doing yard work outside uh, when, you know, raking leaves uh, this fall or something else, you get calluses on the, on the insides of your, uh, on the insides of your hands, and it really it's just your body's way of protecting itself. It's just a build up in, uh, in layers of skin uh, to resist either shear forces or, or pressure. Uh, calluses, um, also very simply, uh, corns are basically on the top of your foot or on the side of your foot, calluses are on the bottom, and we'll talk about that. Uh, but there, so, so the increased pressure, uh, this is related to the biomechanics of how you walk. Uh, it's related to either some type of deformity in regards to the position uh, or, or the structure of your foot. So, so here again, it's my job to, to properly explain to patients that even though you may have gone to a doctor uh, six months ago or a year ago and they may have shaved off a callus, well, if you haven't changed the way you walk or, uh, or, or changed the shoes or had some type of uh, something else, uh, it's, the callus is going to come back. Um, so don't look at me when it comes back because, or don't get mad at me when it comes back because it's, we're, we're not fixing the, the underlying deformity. Um, and, and oftentimes just shaving it off is, is really all the treatment that's necessary. Uh, however, um, calluses have a much bigger implication in patients that uh, specifically at-risk patients, patients that are diabetic, uh, bad blood flow, uh, and, and don't have sensation. Um, these, these can really lead, calluses can be a much more serious uh, uh, risk as far as developing some type of diabetic uh, wound. Uh, and so if you don't, again, if you don't fix the underlying deformity, it's going to come back or, or get worse. So, um, so again, here on the, on the top you can see uh, corns, corns are on the top. Uh, you can see here, basically on the top of your toes, uh, you have some corns, and they're much more focal, whereas calluses are on the bottom of your feet, and they're much, more, much larger and more diffuse. Here again, you see a few calluses. Um, again, so, so calluses, they're not random. They're in a specific spot where you have increased pressure. Uh, they, it's, think of it like a treasure map. The, the callus is the X, and it's marking the exact location of where the increased pressure is. And again, that can be there for a variety of reasons, but regardless, there's increased pressure. The body protects itself by, by, by forming this callus. Uh, you can also get uh, porokeratoses. These are basically corns on the bottom of your foot. These are on non-weight-bearing surfaces, and essentially they're clogged sweat glands. Um, again, uh, patients, you know, sometimes people are able to uh, treat them themselves by just shaving them off or, or taking a petty egg or a nail file and doing this. And in certain patients, that's certainly fine for you to do. Um, it, it's, and it's not like when you come into my office, it's not like I'm, you know, again, performing brain surgery. All I'm taking is a scalpel blade and shaving the callus down. It's just that I have a little bit better angle and, and, and you're not as flexible as you used to be. And so it's, it's just easier for me to do. You can also get a soft callus. 
uh, that's basically in between, usually it's in between your fourth and fifth toes. Uh, again, it's, it's, a, it's a pressure point. It's basically two bones in your small toes rubbing together, causing a callus. Uh, that's usually best treated uh, by, by some type of spacer in between the toes, preventing those two pressure points uh, from, from touching each other. Uh, so treatment for corns and calluses. Again, if, if you have to change, change your shoes, change the way you walk, um, and, and that's not necessarily always realistic. So, so really what it is, you have, you have four options. You can, you can do nothing, and, and corns and calluses by themselves are not painful. It's only when they push on your shoes or when you walk on them, that's only when they become painful. So in some people, they don't hurt, and, and you do nothing about them. And uh, the, the second option is you, you do some type of padding um, associated with it, either to relieve pressure or to prevent the callus from showing up in the first place. The third option is uh, something, you know, is again, just taking a scalpel and shaving, shaving the callus down. And then the fourth option is, uh, the, is doing an actual surgery where you, where you correct the underlying deformity. Uh, Warts, uh, warts we're actually going to skip tonight. Um, nails, so ingrown nails. If I see 20, very, very common, if I see 20, 25 patients in a day, two or three ingrown nails are, are pretty common. Uh, so so a nail, an ingrown nail is, is basically the nail grows a little bit farther down into the skin. It causes an irritation. Sometimes you see some thick white purulence, and it's not really a true infection. It's more so a, a very superficial infection. If you remove the nail, it actually gets better on its own. Um, but a lot of times people just try and try and kind of cut cut back that way and, and fix the nail, and that actually usually makes things worse when the nail grows back. Um, so you come on in, and and here's another example. Here's a little bit more severe example of an ingrown nail, and I and and I tried not to get too too graph. I'm trying to use as many animations and illustrations of problems as opposed to actual wounds and gross stuff, and you know, everybody's eating dinner, so. Um, <laughs> So, so as far as ingrown nails, uh, there's, it's, there, it's easy, you know, you don't feel any pain while we're treating them. It takes about two minutes for me to do. We numb you up. It's a, it's a shot, a shot right there, a, a little anesthetic there, and a little anesthetic there, numbs you up, and then you don't feel anything while we're doing it. But basically all that you do is instead of, again, instead of cutting all the way back, slanting it like that, you actually take it straight back. And, and you can see how minimal it visually looks to you, but there's a good chunk of nail that was underneath that skin. And so you have two options at this point. You either remove the nail and, and let it grow back, and maybe about 50% of the time it grows back in, in the proper fashion, or you can put a chemical on there. And, it's about, and, and you put the chemical right, right back here where the nail matrix, where the nail grows from, but it only touches that part of the matrix, and then about 90, 95% of the time the nail doesn't grow back. Uh, so um, it, it's it's and it's it's easy. It's uh, you know in within uh, it, depending on how bad the infection is and other medical conditions. Sometimes we put people on a short course of antibiotics, um, and but people are able to wear a band aid and some antibiotic ointment on their shoe on their toe the next day. Uh, nail fungus uh, quickly. It's there's a lot of things that look like fungus. So just because your nail is discolored and stuff like that, it's not necessarily nail fungus. Um, the, the topical treatments, the stuff you get at the store, uh, you, you're more than welcome to try it. Sometimes it can be effective. Just understand that because of the concentrations in the medicine, you have to put it on for a long, long time. Um, some of the over-the-counter stuff, if you've seen those commercials for, uh, for Jublia and, and some of those other ones, those big green monsters dancing around, you know, I, I mean, it's an expensive medication and, and it's, you have to paint your nail for every day for 48 weeks to get a 38% effectiveness. And it, it's, that's, not worth, that's not worth it in my opinion. Um, so sometimes you don't do anything about it. Sometimes nails clear on their own. Um, and, but if, again, if it's not painful, it doesn't bother you too much, you don't do anything about it. Uh, the other option is uh, a pill uh, for you. It's terbinafine or Lamisil. Four years ago, or a number of years ago, it used to be much more expensive. Now it's just a four-dollar generic. Um, unfortunately, uh, it, it is a little hard on the liver in certain patients based on other medical conditions and other medications they're taking. And and so, in anybody that we consider that we may not think is necessarily a candidate to take the medicine, we uh, we check liver function tests. It's just a simple blood test. You get it back that afternoon. And and as long as everything looks good, you take the pill. And it's uh, one pill a day for 90 days. Um, but again, it's important to understand that it can take six to nine months for, for everything to get better. Um, so going into some common foot and ankle problems, 
uh, that, that I see and treat. So by far the most common pain that I see is, is plantar fasciitis. Um, or, or it, well, excuse me, it's heel pain. And 90% of the time it's plantar fasciitis. Uh, patients complain that first step out of bed in the morning, it feels like someone's stabbing a knife in the bottom of your foot. Or after you've had periods of prolonged rest, you know, you sit down to watch TV or to have dinner, and then that first step up, again, it feels like a knife in the bottom of your foot. Um, so 90% of the time that this pain and everything is, it's, it is plantar fasciitis. The good news is 95% of people get better without surgery. 3% of patients, three out of those 100 patients that, or excuse me, three out of those five patients that did have surgery were probably misdiagnosed, and uh, two of them, two out of the 100 people actually did need surgery. Um, so it gets better. Uh, a lot of times people pay, you know, doctors, their primary care doctor or somebody, um, not, I'm not banging on them, but, but they'll show a picture of their x-ray and you see this big honking heel spur. And people think that that's what's hurting them. And it's not. And it's, sometimes it's a little difficult for me to tell people that it's, I know it looks like it, but that's not what's hurting you. Um, it's actually your body's way of trying to make it better. Um, so the, uh, the, the way we treat it, well, the way pe people try and treat it at home is, first of all, they go and they get these heel cups. And again, so the, the, the important thing to understand that, that I talk about up here is what you need is support. You don't need, you, yes, and it's, it's, again, it's a little difficult to, to, to initially understand that, you know, my feet hurt. I don't I want to cushion them and pat them and make them feel better. And the answer is no, you want support. So these heel cups that, you know, they, they don't work for plantar fasciitis. Uh, going, uh, going across the street to Walmart and seeing this Dr. Scholl's machine, um, you stand on it, it tells you which ones you should get, A4 or BC, B3 or something like that. Again, you know, I'm sorry to tell you, you, you wasted 40 bucks. Um, it's, it, it's just not effective, it's not supportive enough. Um, the good news is, though, that $40 could have been better spent on just an over-the-counter hard insert, something that you can see is going to mold and prop up that arch. Um, and so, so over-the-counter inserts, you know, anywhere from thirty to forty, fifty dollars. It kind of depends on the brand and everything. Um, but they they work great. Most the vast vast majority of patients respond well to over-the-counter um, the inserts that you can buy at Browns or at, or online or or at the store at some of the sporting goods stores. Typically not uh, Target or, or Walmart or some of those uh, big box stores. Um, Good supportive shoes. A shoe's supposed to bend right here because this is where your foot bends. Uh, you know, I mean, some of these shoes, and, and I'm, I'm, I always show patients in clinic, like, I show them my shoes. My shoes bend right here, and they twist side to side, but I don't have foot pain, so I can wear whatever shoes I want. Um, and, but, but, a good, but if you have foot pain, you should wear good supportive shoes that bend here because that's where your foot's supposed to bend. Uh, so the good news is the, the best way, it's, it's very, very easy to, fi to fix plantar fasciitis. Um, and again, 95% of the time it gets effective with, it gets better without surgery. The main treatment is stretching and it's all directed at stretching your Achilles tendon or your heel cord, that big tendon in the back of your leg that, you can, that inserts into your foot. Um, the, again, wearing proper shoes, wearing orthotics, uh, not going barefoot. Um, all these things place stress on the arch and cause that ligament to, uh, to, to cause pain. Uh, you sometimes do things as, with uh, inflammation, either a short course of steroids or sometimes a needle in the foot, um, which, which nobody wants, but, but it definitely makes people better and definitely has its role in treating people. Um, and then modifying your activity and then a little bit of patience. When, when people come in and they come in with seven out of 10, you know, I always tell people like, you know, rate your pain, zero, no pain, 10, jump off a bridge pain. And in, uh, a lot of the times it's a lot higher, it's, it's closer to 10 and I don't, you know, but everybody's got their own levels of pain. And, but you know, if somebody comes in with seven out of 10 pain, if I see them back after four weeks and if, if they say they feel better at like a four out of 10 or a three out of 10, that's a success. Um, it's, there's, there's still work to go, but, but going from a seven to a four with plantar fasciitis, that's a good thing. So, um, it, it, it takes time. Uh, going into bunions and hammer toes, um, every, you know, everybody knows their, everybody's grandma, my grandma or my, whoever had bunion, had terrible bunions, but, um, so as far as the cause of them, it's simply, it's a muscle and tendon imbalance. Uh, the, the, the muscles and tendons on the, on, this is the inside of the foot, this is the outside. These muscles and tendons and other biomechanical reasons uh, pull a little bit harder and than the muscles over here and cause a bunion. And same thing with hammer toes. You can see there's a couple little joints in your toes and um, here's that corn that I talked about on the top of your toe. And, and here's where the callus would be from that head, be the metatarsal head being really prominent. But basically this tendon here is pulling a little harder than that tendon there and it causes the toes to scrunch up and you got a hammer toe. 
So what do you do about them? Or excuse me, why do you, why do you have them? Uh, there's certainly a genetic component to it. Uh, again, somebody's, your grandma had terrible feet um, and she had terrible bunions. Uh, there's shoes certainly play a role. Uh, women that wear high heels or narrow, very narrow shoes, that, that, that absolutely has, has a role in helping develop hammer toes and, uh, and bunions. Uh, there's, there's other problems. Some of it's just the way that you walk and the way that your foot is. Uh, as far as what you do about it, again, if it's not painful, you don't fix it. Um, if, if it is painful, you fix it. And you do that one of two ways. Uh, you, can either, you can either use some type of padding, um, uh, some type of bracing or something to kind of hold the toe or the, or the, the big toe in place. It doesn't, it's important to understand this does not uh, prevent the, the further, further development of the deformity, but, but it can make it feel better and it keeps it from rubbing on your shoe. And, and so it absolutely has its role. And, and a lot of times, you know, you can get these at, at the store or over the counter. And, and I give these out to patients all day long when they come in with, with, uh, with bunions and hammer toes. Um, and, or wider shoes or taller shoes uh, that have more room for your hammer toe. A lot of the times, you know, I see people, there's a popular brand that a lot of people wear, uh, SAS, and, and, they're, and they're great shoes, uh, but, they, but they're made out of leather, and, and leather doesn't stretch, um, at least not very easily. And so when you have a hammer toe, um, there's no room for the toe to go, so it rubs on the top of the shoe. So a lot of the people with hammer toes and bunions, you know, I re generally recommend shoes with, uh, with fabric at the end where your toes are. And that basically allows for the, if, either a taller toe box, which is where your toes go, um, to allow for room for that hammer toe or bunion, or, or a different shoe where it's not leather, but it's fabric, and that's what, um, and it, it just, it basically there's more room, and it stretches and allows for lack of pressure there. Uh, so when it could, but sometimes you do need surgery for this, and, and it's important to understand that um, there's different degrees of bunions, and you treat them, you have to treat them differently. Uh, this bunion here is mild, moderate, and severe, and here you see the x-rays associated with that, but you treat that, ex that, you treat that bunion surgically very, very different than that one. Uh, so, and, 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 and they form for different reasons, and that's kind of beyond this, but here you see kind of a mild bunion, and you, you put a little screw in, you, you cut the bone up here at the end of this metatarsal, and you put a screw in, and you move that he metatarsal head that way, and, and you can walk on that the next day. I mean, you're not really going to want to, it's, it's painful, and, it, and the inflammation hurts, but, but in theory, I mean, you can walk, you can get up and go to the bathroom, and, you know, after a couple of days, the inflammation goes down, but you can, you can walk on this right away in a surgical shoe. And, and that's a good procedure. I do it sometimes. Um, but, but a lot of the times when people come in with bunions, they're, they're a lot more severe. They're, they're, they're that bunion, not, not that bunion. And, and, and this bunion here, I mean, you're, so instead of fixing it up here, you actually kind, you basically remove this joint here. And we'll talk about some of the concepts of joint, uh, of removing joints. Um, but you, you fix it right here, and that you can see that actually straightens it down here. Like when, you, when, you, when this person did this bunion, they didn't touch this right here. They only did work right there, and that's what they got. But that requires six weeks, four to six weeks, closer to six weeks of not putting any pressure on it. And again, for, there's some people out there that that's, that's just not realistic for. And so I have, I have lots of patients out there that, um, that if, they came in with a, with, if they came in with this bunion, uh, but they said, I can't take six weeks off from work, or I can't take six weeks off. I wouldn't, and I, I'd be doing them a disservice. And, and unfortunately, there's some people out there that do try and stretch the indications uh, for the procedure, the Austin bunionectomy. But this, is not, this procedure right here is not the appropriate uh, uh, surgery for that one, because it's, there's a greater chance it comes back. There's a greater chance it doesn't properly correct it and causes other problems. So I, 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 I have patients walking around that... You can't, because they can't commit to doing this surgery, they just kind of have to live with and deal with the pain associated with the bunion because I, I, I would be doing them a disservice if I had corrected it this way and let them walk on it right away. Hammer toe, uh, quickly, it's um, basically you cut out part of the joint and you, based on which joint it is, and which toe it is, and why it happened, uh, you, you basically remove the joint and either sew everything back together and there's a little bit of floppiness in the joint and arthroplasty, or sometimes you put a wire across it or an implant across it and you make it hard and um, into, into a straight toe that doesn't bend. Uh, forefoot pain, uh, neuromas, this is a very, also a very common thing I see. Uh, patients come in complaining of pain in their forefoot. Uh, they, they, the, the, 
the complaints that you hear universally are they feel like they're walking on a wadded up sock or they're, they're walking on a pebble. Um, as soon as they take off their shoes, their foot feels much better because um, it feels like the shoe is, is pushing it side to side. And, and so there's, there's nerves that run in between each of the bones and they, begin, they can become inflamed and, and irritated. Um, and so you can see how shoes uh, that kind of compress all these, squish all these bones together would cause irritation of that nerve. Uh, clini er, in, in clinic, they respond best to, uh, to steroid injections. It basically calms everything down. Uh, sometimes one's, one's all that people need, sometimes they need a couple of them. Uh, it it kind of depends on how big it is and how, how long it's been going on for. Um, but but, they, uh, but some, sometimes surgery is necessary. It's, a, it's an easy surgery. It's just a little incision right here and you remove the nerve and there's a little bit of numbness associated with it. Uh, some different uh, kind of injuries that patients suffer from. Uh, sprained angles, we'll talk about plantar fasciitis, I already covered Achilles tendonitis and stress fractures. Um, so so there's, uh, there's three different types of uh, sprains. Uh, first of all, I guess when it comes to ankle sprains, it's important to understand the vast majority of ankle sprains, um, first of all, walk on it as soon as you can and, and get range of motion as soon as you can. Most ankle sprains do not need, you don't need to go to the ER, you don't need to go to, to go see your doctor. Um, if you can walk on, if you can put weight on it and stand on it 10, 15 minutes later, it's, it's probably okay, it's probably a mild, um, a mild ankle sprain. Uh, you're, you're, if, especially when it's mild and you're using, a cat, or using a, an ankle brace or crutches or something, you're doing yourself a disservice. It's gonna be a longer, a longer recovery. Um, for them, you, you need range of motion and you need pressure. Um, they uh, ankle sprains also. Uh, so so in regards to treatment, there well first of all there's three different types. There's three different grades. Um, well they, excuse me the so there's three different ligaments associated with it. They're, the most commonly ruptured is this one right here, the anterior talofibular ligament, and then there's two other ligaments. But this is the most commonly ruptured. And then there's three different types of ankle sprains. Grade one, you basically just stretch the ligament out. Uh, grade two, you, uh, you, it's partially tear it. Grade three, you uh, completely tear it. The good news is even in grade three sprains, after you've had that period of immobilization and, and you've not put weight on it for, for a week or two, um, you still kind of basically treat everything the same way. And so remembering the mnemonic RICE, uh, rest, ice, compression, and elevation, and all of it is, is centered at decreasing swelling and, and um, allowing all the pain and swelling and inflammation to calm down. Uh, the second stage, uh, so again, there's three stages of rehabilitation. There's the right stage. Uh, second stage is you uh, start increasing your range of motion, increasing strengthening. And then the third stage is you return to activity. Typically after an ankle sprain, you know, four to six weeks, you're, you're good to go. Uh, however, you can, once you start spraining your ankle a lot and stretching everything out, you can get chronic ankle instability. Uh, these patients come in and, and they complain of that they roll their ankle very, very easily. Uh, they, something as simple as stepping out of a truck, they roll their ankle. And at this point, it's no longer painful because the ligaments have been stretched out so many times. Um, they say, like, stepping on a garden hose, they'll roll their ankle. Uh, cutting the grass in the backyard, they feel unstable. Um, they, they only wear, want to wear lace-up boots because that's the only thing that makes them feel stable. These are all kind of common things that I hear. Um, so, so basically, these patients have suffered from recurrent ankle sprains and, uh, of these ligaments. And, and, and again, they've stretched them out, they've healed together in a lengthened position. And so, so there are, there's an ankle instability, and there's two types. There's a functional ankle instability, and that's basically where the muscles and tendons that help uh, stabilize the ankle, um, they actually uh, are weak and they're not properly functioning. Now, the good news is physical, these patients respond well to physical therapy. You strengthen these and they're able to, to help combat the recurrent ankle sprains. But then there's a certain subset of patients that need surgery, and these have, they're, they, they're the ones that have mechanical instability. The, the ligaments are no good, basically. Uh, so the surgery for that is, there's multiple ways to do it. Um, it sometimes it's with your own tissue, sometimes it's with uh, uh, your own tendons, sometimes it's with cadaver tendons, um, and then sometimes it's with a, uh, a piece of synthetic material. But basically all you're doing is recreating the ligament and restabilizing the ankle. Um, but, uh, when you do do this, there's other associated problems with this. Uh, and, and so chronic ankle instability can turn into chronic ankle pain. Uh, there's other reasons you can have chronic ankle pain. Um, there's just old, just age, wear and tear, and just osteoarthritis. Just like you get in your knees and hips, you can get it in your ankle. Um, it's, it's actually less common than other forms of arthritis, but you can absolutely get it. 
Uh, patients that suffer from rheumatoid arthritis, the ankle joint is a, is a, is a, a big place where rheumatoid arthritis certainly affects the ankle. Uh, post-traumatic, if you've had an ankle fracture in the past, uh, those are definitely more prone to developing arthritis. Uh, again, patients with chronic ankle instability. Um, so the way we treat ankle arthritis, uh, first of all, uh, bracing. Uh, there's, a, there's a variety of different types of braces that you can use. Um, and, and, and they certainly work, and in certain patients, that's absolutely the correct treatment. Uh, some patients benefit from steroid injections, just like you get injections in your knee, uh, you do the same thing in, into, your, into your ankle. Um, you know, primary care doctors do these, uh, your orthopedic doctor does these, the podiatrist does these, pain management doctors do, do these. Um, I, I think you should come, come to me to do them, but, um, <laughs> but, but they're, I mean, it's, it's, it's relatively simple and they're, and they're successful. And, and just like you do it in your knee before, some of you may have had your knee replacement, um, they, 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 they can work sometimes. Uh, sometimes one shot works for six months, sometimes one shot's all you need, sometimes you need three or four shots in a year, and, and then at some point they stop working. And they're, and they're not effective when it's bone on bone. Um, at that point, then you kind of go into some different, uh, some different things, uh, so, you know, fuse, fusing the joint versus replacing the joint. Uh, but another, another possible option is ankle arth arthroscopy. So the goals of ankle arthroscopy, just like in, just like in a knee scope, if, if some of you had basically a, a camera and a little shaver stuck inside your knee, two little small little incisions on the front of the ankle, Stick a camera in there, look around, look at the joint surfaces, and shave out and get rid of all the in chronically inflamed tissue. Um, it's a, it's a, right now, I'm actually the only, uh, only doctor here in Hutchinson who's performing this, this surgery. Um, and and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, first of all, it is surgery. It's got risks. All surgery has risks associated with it. Um, but it's, it's easy. It's outpatient surgery, uh, 20, 30 minutes. And if, if it's an isolated ankle scope, uh, in you know, two to three days, you're, you're able to walk on it. Uh, sometimes with some of those associated injuries, there's tendon work that needs to be done or ligament work that needs to be done, and you may have a longer period of non-weight bearing. Uh, going on to Achilles tendon, um, so, so your Achilles tendon is, it's actually, you know, this is what people think of as their Achilles tendon, but it actually comes from two different muscles up here. There's the gastrocnemius muscle, which is what you, which is kind of on the outside, which is what you see when you see those two different, two different heads to the gastroc muscle. And then there's the underlying muscle, the soleus muscle. Um, uh, and, and so they actually each, so there's two different muscles and they kind of join to form, they each have a tendinous insertion or a tendinous portion and they form the, uh, the Achilles tendon. Uh, the, the, the main problem associated with that the Achilles tendon causes is it's called equinus and basically it's tightness of the Achilles tendon. And it's actually a si kind of a, a silent problem. Uh, people don't say, oh, my equinus hurts. It manifests itself in different ways. Uh, it places, it, because you, you basically have less range of motion because this is tight, you have less range of motion at your ankle, and it places increased pressure on the bottom of your foot. It can cause, it's, it's has, it has roles in developing of uh, diabetic foot ulcers, um, uh, arthritis, bunions, hammer toes, it, it, plantar fasciitis, it has, it plays a role in lots of things. Um, the, again, the good news is stretching is, is the way to, to help with Aquinas. Uh, when that's not successful, surgically, you treat it basically just by cutting part of the tendon and allowing it to lengthen. Uh, tendonitis and tendinosis, this gets in, there's two different versions of it. Um, here you, you're looking at the back of the ankle, your Achilles tendon is coming down right here. It can be either non-insertional, which is kind of the mid-substance where you get thickening of the tendon, uh, or you can have insertional where you basically have a bump on the back of your heel. There's actually a, uh, a heel spur right, right in there, I mean, and I, I picked a really bad example. I mean, a severe example, and most people's spurs aren't that big, but it kind of shows you what can happen. And, uh, and, and so you can see that's where, this is where the Achilles com tendon comes down and inserts, and you can get calcification and thickening of the tendon. Uh, the, the way we treat these is, is again, rest and immobilization, wearing one of those big tall cam boots that comes up to, comes up to about right here. Uh, those, those boots basically prevent range of motion at the ankle. Ankle allows everything to calm down and, and uh, you wear one of those for four to six weeks and, and it gets better. Um, it, it, you're all, again, this has not gone anywhere, um, so you're always kind of at risk for further, for further irritating it. Um, and, and at that point, then there's, there's surgery involved, involved with that.
stress fractures. Um, stress fractures very common. You see these. You see these uh, in certain subsets of populations. You see it in um, young athletes, uh, specifically women, involved in, around the time of in, involving menstruation, um, has some things to do with bone health. Uh, you see it in athletes who have a, a very sudden increase in training, um, or you see it in people that normally don't get a lot of exercise. Around, around, um, uh, the, around the fair time, I, I had a lot of patients coming in afterwards with stress fractures, and they normally don't walk a whole lot, but then they went to the fair and they walked 10 hours that, on, on one day, and all of a sudden the next day they, cut their, they wake up and their foot hurts and they have a stress fracture. It's a it's a very area of very very focal pain. It's red. It's hot. It's swollen. Um, it can be really hard to see on X-ray. I mean, there's there's you see a little bit of fluffy white stuff right there, and that's that's what a stress fracture can look like. And it can even take a few weeks for even that to show up. So stress fractures, you treat those clinically. Um, it's kind of a, a diagnosis of exclusion. You look at the X-ray. You don't see anything. You you go through their symptoms and and their history, and if nothing else adds up, you say, oh, you have a stress fracture. Um, and, and there's more advanced imaging that you can do to, uh, to determine that, yes, you have a stress fracture, but it's, it's often unnecessary um, because it is a relatively easy clinical diagnosis. And again, you wear a boot and you don't put it, and fortunately, this one, you're usually allowed to walk on it right away. Um, but you wear a boot for four to six weeks and, and hopefully it gets better. Um, sometimes it can take a little bit longer. Uh, it does have, um, you know, there are certain things associated with stress fractures. Uh, vitamin D and calcium, the American Geriatric Society recommends uh, that, that uh, geriatric uh, people basically, uh, a, a thousand units of vi vitamin D a day and a um, uh, thousand milligrams of calcium a day. Um, some patients that, I, that do come in with stress fractures, I do actually draw blood and we check these levels and then put them on the appropriate supplementation. Uh, quickly, uh, flat foot deformity. So this is basically collapse, the collapse of your arch. It's also known as, and, and now it's, it's critical to understand this is not a flat foot in, in terms of you've had a flat foot all your life and this, that's not what this is. This is somebody who had a normal, a normal arch and it collapsed. Usually it happens to somebody, it most often happens to, to women, but um, and mostly around the ages of 40, 50, or 60. Um, it's also known as adult acquired flat foot deformity or posterior tibial tendon dysfunction. And, uh, and, and also I should stress, just because you have a flat foot and you were born with a flat foot, that doesn't mean it's painful. It's not necessarily a bad thing. There's a lot of people out there with, with flat feet and they have no pain and there's, there's no need for treatment or no need for orthotics or any fancy shoes or anything like that. Uh, so patients, so here you can see kind of what's happening. Here's, a, here's the patient with the normal foot on the side. On one side, on the left side, and on the right, you can see how the inside of their ankle is kind of collapsed in. And they, so they complain of pain in the arch, uh, pain at the inside of the ankle right along here where some of these tendons are. Um, they, they have pain when they try and step on their toe or stand up on their tiptoes or try and go upstairs. With, you can see how here how over time with long-standing deformity, you can get pain on the outside of the ankle. Um, and here's another, another example. Uh, so it's a, it's a progressive deformity. Um, unfortunately, by the time people present to my office, it's typically in the, kind of in the later stages. Uh, but if you catch it early enough, um, going into it, wearing a boot, letting the tendons calm down is, is how you, for four to six weeks, is how you treat it. Um, again, unfortunately, it's, uh, by the time I see it, it can be a little bit uh, further along and, and somewhere along this. And typically, if, you know, this, if this patient were to walk into my office, I'd put them in a boot for four to six weeks. If they don't get, if they're not better in four to six weeks, it's you're talking about surgery, unfortunately, um, because because that doesn't get better on its own. Um, and and I guess I, I apologize. It's not necessarily surgery. Um, it, again, bracing in the right popula patient population, um, bracing is absolutely the correct and appropriate, um, and a very a very good uh, a treatment. Um, but there is a certain subset of patients that do need surgery. And as you can see here, I mean, you can see how flat that foot is uh, and how that foot's not flat, but there's a lot of bones or a lot of plates and screws and stuff involved, um, and it's, it's a big surgery. It takes six to eight to ten weeks for, before you can put weight on it, and it's, not, and it's not anything that anybody wants to have to go through if they don't have to, um, but if the pain and the st instability and deformity is too much, that is something that you need to do. Uh, so one of the things we've been talking about here, and you can see it, you can see it right here through these joints, this concept through these joints, and, and these joints right here, 
is so at the very beginning we talked about there's so many different bones in the foot and ankle and none of the joints there are some joints that are more important than others but none of them are truly um, absolutely necessary and so you can take you can take advantage of having other jo adjacent joints um, you can take advantage of that and so while some joints are do certainly can be replaced and I certainly do those procedures uh, kind of the gold standard is arthrodesis or fusing of the joints and that's basically where you remove the cartilage from both sides of the joint you uh, put some and so it's a nice healthy bleeding bone you put a couple screws and plates across it and two bones turn into one bone and it's called uh, joint arthrodesis here you can see this is be, this being done, this is your big toe. You've got a lot of uh, arthritis in there and you basically essentially cut the joint out, put a plate across it, and it becomes one joint. Um, again, you can see it here. This is doing it in the ankle. You put a couple, again, scrape the cartilage off and now you're, so you've got uh, your ankle joint um, and then you get motion through your other joints. And here's the subtalar joint, which is actually the joint below the ankle. Oftentimes when it comes to this type of stuff, you know, it's better explained um, when when I can when patients come in I've got this model and it's easier for me to point you know to point to where their pain is and and then show them this model and it makes a little more sense but but it's 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 interesting and that's what makes it makes things different where you know the shoulder and the knee it's all about mobility it's all, you you want range of motion you replace knees the foot and ankles different you can you, when there's pain instability or deformity um, you you fuse the joint um, it's it's but it's not a benign procedure. Um, you do you are at risk of developing arthritis and adjacent joints. But but it is a good good procedure and it is considered kind of the gold standard. Uh, quickly, pediatric foot and ankle. Um, some general complaints I get about about uh, kids in foot and ankle. First of all, they don't complain about their feet hurting. Uh, instead, what they do is they say they make up an excuse why they don't want to go to the fair or why they don't want to go to the water park. Uh, they will um, they they don't complain about pain. Because um, they and, and then if they do, they're not able to really, really fully express what hurts and where it hurts. Uh, you'll find them tripping, not walking on uneven, uh, walking on level ground. They'll trip and fall. They'll find reasons not to want to go to gym class and make up excuses. So so ask questions, pay attention. Uh, other things. Um, it's normal. It's it's perfectly okay for a kid to be walking on their toes up to the age of seven. Uh, your five-year-old grandchild or child with flat feet, they're just fine most likely. Um, an arch doesn't actually develop until about the age of seven. Um, and then commonly you see kids, spe specifically kids with uh, increased athletic activity, uh, get heel pain, and, um, and that's Seaver's disease. Um, it's basically growing pains. You treat that with just uh, rest and ice. So uh, not to end on a, on a uh, to end on a note, on an important note, but but nothing too um, too too bad, I guess I should say. Um, but diabetes, it's it's a big problem in our population. Uh, it's you know it's it, some of the complications associated with diabetes are obviously beyond the scope of this uh, presentation tonight. But it's increasing. I mean, almost 10% of the population now is suffering from diabetes. Uh, that's that's almost 30 million people. With, with diabetes. Uh, of, of diabetics, 15% of people will develop a foot ulcer in their lifetime. Of those 15% that develop an ulcer, uh, up to a quarter of them will actually get an amputation. An, ampu an amputation of a toe or, or more, it's, there's, a lot, there's some very, very serious implications with that. Uh, it's, you know, we, there's a fi the five-year mortality rate after a, diab a lower extremity diabetic foot amputation is 43 to 55 percent in some different studies. I mean, so that's that's higher. So basically, in five years, people that that have after their first uh, lower extremity amputation, they're dead. Half the people are dead within five years. I mean, that's higher. And then not not to take away by any means from you know prostate cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, but those that's that's higher. That's a higher mortality rate at five years for a, for a diabetic foot amputation than for some of these cancers that we see. Um, and, then, and then there's, a, there's other uh, problems associated with these. The average cost in year one of an amputation is $70,000. They're associated with higher rates of depression, uh, lower quality of life. Um, they're, 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 they're having to have an amputation, is, a diabetic foot amputation is not a good thing. Um, so certain people are so have have risk factors for diabetic foot ulcers. The scary thing is that up to fifty percent of people don't have any symptoms. Um, so so seeing your doctor on a regular on a regular um, basis is important. 
Uh, getting a good physical exam is important. Uh, some common things, especially that I see, peripheral neuropathy, and, which is where you basically lose uh, sensation in your feet, um, you're, you, and then peripheral vascular disease or bad blood flow. These are, are all risk factors for developing diabetic foot ulcers. Uh, the good news is, here in Hutchinson, we've got some great doctors. Um, proper care of diabetic foot ulcers requires a multidisciplinary team. It requires myself as a podiatrist. Uh, there's a number of doctors here, both at the clinic and, and, and that see patients here at the hospital in their private offices, vascular surgeons uh, that, that help reestablish blood flow when there's blockages. Uh, your endocrinologist and your internal medicine and your fa family practice doctor manage your, your blood sugar medications. Uh, nephrology for your kidneys, ophthalmology for your eyes, all these people are, are important when it comes to properly taking care of, of your di diabetes and preventing diabetic foot ulcerations. So to end, uh, some do's and don'ts of diabetic foot care. First of all, do control your blood sugar. Um, some poor, poor control of your blood sugar besides just getting, you know, lecture, having your little glu glucometer tell you what it's, that it's high and you feeling kind of bad about it. There's, there's some real, uh, real problems associated with this. Um, the, uh, there's no, the, the numbness and tingling. It gets worse the, wor the more poorly your blood sugar is controlled. Uh, wounds heal. Uh, these, these ulcers that you get, um, they heal slower when you have poor uh, control of your blood sugar. Uh, inspect your feet daily. Um, something that simple. Look at your feet. Uh, there's, you know, whether it's, whether it's because your neck is stiff or you can't see your feet. Um, you know, if, if you can't see your feet, put a mirror on the floor and then just hover your foot over there and, uh, and, and use that to, to look at your feet daily. Have your partner or your neighbor look at your feet. Uh, make sure that, that, that everything's okay, there's no open wounds. Uh, wear proper shoes. Medicare covers, uh, they cover one pair of shoes, diabetic shoes, and in uh, three pairs of custom inserts a year. This is for a certain patient, diabetic patients. Um, this, is, uh, this is all taken care of through your primary care doctor. Uh, diabetic shoes have been shown to decrease the risk of development of ulcers. In, in, in diabetics. Uh, moisturize your feet, skin it cracks in, in your heels and in your skin can lead to skin infection and lead to problems. Um, but however, do be careful that you don't put it between your toes. Uh, you can get increased moisture between your toes and can, can cause problems. Um, and then see your doctor at least yearly. Uh, when it comes, if you're a well-controlled diabetic, it can be any doctor, make sure they look at your feet. Um, if you're a, kind of an at-risk uh, diabetic with bad blood flow, bad sensation in your feet, you know, see your podiatrist yearly. Um, if you've got other problems with severe peripheral vascular disease and other things, sometimes you need to see people more often. Uh, don't, don't go barefoot because um, you have no feeling in your feet, uh, the patients with neuropathy. It's, it's crazy, I have patients come in that they take off their shoe and a rock falls out of their foot. They had no idea it was there. Or their, their grandkid's little toy army soldier is in the bottom of their, uh, is in, inside their shoe. And it caused a big hole in the bottom of their foot. And they had no idea it was there. They couldn't feel it. I mean, it's, neuropathy is a, a really serious problem. Uh, don't ignore cuts and scrapes. Again, when you're diabetic, you, you have a decreased ability to heal wounds. And those cuts and scrapes can become much more. Uh, don't, those corns that we were talking about on the top of your toes, do not use medicated corns and pads. Um, they've got, it's, it's, there's harsh chemicals in there, and you don't, again, you can't feel how, how if you leave it on for too long, you can call, actually cause an ulcer by using some of these medicated pads. Uh, don't perform bathroom surgery. Uh, you know, whether it's trying to shave your callus off or clip your nails, um, in a certain subset of patients, patients that are diabetic with bad blood flow and bad sensation, Medicare does cover um, trimming of, of, of toenails. So, so that's it. I know, I'm sorry, I apologize, that was kind of long. Uh, there, was kinda, there was a lot I wanted to cover. Um, so uh, f quickly, uh, there's, so foothealthfacts.org. This is a, um, I don't think I can click on there by any, any way. Oh, well, uh, anyways, foothealthfacts.org. It's just a great website. It's a consumer website for the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons, which I'm a member of, and, an associate of, I should say, not a member, an associate. Um, membership takes longer time and, um, and some other stuff, but an associate of. And it's, it's, it's a good resource when it comes to answering basic questions on foot and ankle conditions. Um, and, and then here's my, here's my contact inf information. We've got some cards in the back. Uh, some of my cards as well. So I see, like I said, I see patients across the street. Uh, my, my, right now I'm not seeing patients on Tuesdays. Um, I'm doing some outreach 
clinics uh, in some of the surrounding towns. Um, but some of that's getting rearranged, and then as I'm soon adding, seeing patients over at the wound care center. So my schedule is changing a little bit, but um, but but it's always it's it's always possible to get in and, and see me um, for, and we can take a look at everything. So. All right. Thank you. We're going to open up this time for some questions.